Jeff, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate it very much. We're going to talk all about Connecticut Challenge <coughs> and what you have built over the course of years and helping back. We're going to talk about Run Across America, Swim Across America, Swim Across the Sound, and every other thing that you're doing right now. But I want to, as we build up to what you are doing now, at 12 years old, something happens in your life and they find cancer. Take me back to, to what that was like for your folks and a kid who's 12 years old being told he has cancer and is going to have to have an amputation. So my parents, um, you have to sort of frame it out back then when I was 12, I was this vibrant kid who was outside every day. I was on three different all-star teams playing hockey, baseball, football. Um, and I say that not to stick my chest up, only to say that I was just you were a normal kid. A normal kid, yeah. and um, athletics came really easy to me. So um, I think the hardest part for my parents was all of a sudden they saw this vibrant kid who was, you know, starting to climb the ladder in athletics, and then in the in the instant, one little fraction of a, a moment on the ice uh, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, my world changed, their world changed when I was skating on a fast break and was uh, tripped from behind and slammed into the boards and uh, I cracked my knee. And the next uh, two days later, they found a, a hairline fracture on my knee and behind that they found a tumor. Otherwise they would have not have found the tumor. Correct, um, luckily, you know, Somebody was looking out from above. Uh, as we all know, when cancer gets into your body, it, it speeds rapidly. And uh, with osteogenic sarcoma or bone cancer, which is what I had, it would have spread to my lung had it um, continued to grow. But thankfully, that one injury uh, brought it out. An amputation followed on uh, Christmas Eve, 1974. My um, right leg was amputated and um, was What's followed. it like to wake up with, without that part of your leg there? You know, I, th I think uh, I was not completely forewarned for many reasons. Um, doctors said they're going to remove a part of my leg, but never used the word amputation or said that you're going to have one leg for the rest of our life. So I do remember it was like literally like yesterday, waking up in the room um, by myself with a nurse next to me, my parents were down the hall, and the first sight looking down at the end of my bed and seeing my leg not there, and, and obviously I was 12, I was in tears, um, as anybody would be, um, and it was very, very frightening. It was not easy to comprehend because I literally just wanted to jump out of bed and go back to my hockey practice, and back in the mid-70s, that was the dark ages of prosthetics, uh, the you know, sort of the, the, the general consensus across the country was amputees um, would sit at home or would just not do sports. And to me, that was not acceptable. And, um, you know, I, I made a pact with myself in the hospital room. <clears throat> Two days later, they showed me a picture of Teddy Kennedy Jr. Ski, learning to ski on one leg. And that, to me, was the beacon of light that I needed. And it changed everything. How did you get going? You're 12 years old, you've had this amputation, and I think about other children that I see. How did you get, what was the motivation? You saw Ted Kennedy Jr. How did, those early days, how did you get up and get going? Because you talked about the, the dark days where the prosthetics were terrible. Yeah, prosthetics were terrible. You didn't actually get fitted for a prosthesis until three or four months later. So I was actually walking around on crutches. On top of that, I also had to face chemotherapy every three weeks, which, you know, when they put these toxic drugs in your body at that age, um, trying to recover every three weeks and get back into school, and all of a sudden you go back to the hospital. Um, I, ha I was treated up at Dana-Farber in Boston at the time, and I've always said, you know, the doctors and the nurses were great, but, you know, the environment that I was in was absolutely horrendous. Um, it How was. So? It was not, um, it was, we were really one of the first group of pediatric cancer survivors to get chemotherapy. And even the nurses and the doctors didn't really know what the long-term effects would be 
or even the short term and um, you know the sickness that we went through um, the uh, the dark rooms in hospital old decayed hospital rooms there was no Ronald McDonald house there were no really no social workers it was really you relied on your family you relied on your friends and you know for me at the age 12 I'm not sure I understood religion but I believed in something else I believe my grandparents used to basically instill in me that um, Jeff someday you're gonna get through this your life's gonna be back to normal and I, I think the blessing for me was my parents said to me literally a week after my amputation, we're gonna take you skiing in Vermont. And that was the one thing that I held on to through all the darkness in the next two years. Um, every time my parents said I could ski, it just brought light to me mm -hmm. and um, was really a symbol for the rest of my life that if I could ski on one leg, I could do anything. And that was the beginning. So you got going in earnest. You really got going. Describe for me once you started skiing and the other things that followed in high school and in college, which brings us to run across America and swim across America and swim across the sound. You know, it was a little bit of a trial and error period. Back then, you didn't have television programs that showed other amputees um, doing sports or you know, participating in sports. I had snapshots and vignettes of pictures. You didn't have the internet to do searches. Um, the, the, the convention out there was that, as I said, you're supposed to sit at home, but I was a rebel. And I was, in my own mind, I was not gonna accept what the doctors told me. Uh, not, not really the doctors per se, but the prosthetic field, um, because my, my orthopedic surgeon was great. He was like, go do anything you want. The sky's the limit. Um, he just was cut from a different cloth and thank God um, he was. And I just focused on listening on the positives. I stopped li listening to people say I can't do things. And I kept telling myself I can do anything I want. Um, and I had a, a great family to get me through that. So the answer to your question is um, how did I get through the next timeline of getting into you know, high school? I tested things. You know, I went out and tried out for the, the baseball team in eighth grade. And then I got on. And were people saying, "He's dead. let's just play along. He he's not going to make the team. That's that's not going to work." I mean, wh what were they saying to you? I if they did, I didn't listen. My uh -huh. brother was a phenomenal athlete. My sister was an athlete. I grew up in a family that sports was just all around us. And to me, my mindset hadn't changed. I might have lost my leg, but I remember my football coaches from the fall before you know, just coaching me and my mindset was I'm still an athlete and I don't care if I'm missing this leg, but I, I made a pact with myself and, and right around freshman year in high school, I said, you know something, I'm gonna play a division one sport in college and someday I'm gonna do an endurance event. And I didn't, at the time when I was ni in ninth grade, I, I thought about running across America, but I, I did say to myself, I'm gonna do three things and I'm gonna, Play Division One sport in college, which you did do for BC. Run across America, and then, at some point, make a difference in this world. Okay, so you become the goalie, lacrosse goalie at, at BC. You run across America. I think it takes you nine months to do that, or so. You, you then, fast forward. You go into the financial world at some point, and you become a bonds guy, and. It's, at some point you say to yourself, and, and you marry and you have three kids, you say to yourself, I'm hopping out of this and I'm gonna build CT Challenge and I'm going to do all of these other programs and I'm gonna concentrate on some kids who are getting cancer. So when did the light go off to say, you know what, I'm really done with the financial world, I, I need to do something different? Well. Take a step back a little bit. Um, you know, we all have a defining moment in our life. And sure. for me, it was June 28th, 1981. And I was a sophomore in college. And that's when the light switch went on. Terry Fox, who was the young Canadian that lost his leg to mm -hmm. cancer, had run three quarters of the way across Canada and died on my birthday on June 28th, 1981. And it was that day that, that I said to myself, you know something? 
Um, I was in college, I had made the team, I was playing lacrosse, and I said, I'm going to do what Terry did across this country and continue to carry um, the torch. And it was then that I started saying, well, if I do an athletic event, why don't I do it for something? And, you know, Terry really taught me that you can do an athletic event, prove to people that you weren't physically disabled, and also raise a lot of money for a cause. And the cause for me was cancer. Um, in the, and so when I, when, I, when I was sort of inspired by Terry in that year, I spent the next four or five years really starting to formulate a philosophy of, I want to give back. Um, how can I do this? Um, I, th I think I need to go build my professional career first, and I happened to choose the financial services industry and went to work in the investment banking area for 18 years. But during that entire time, I literally lived the double life. So you had the mindset that you're going to do something else. Yeah, and, and we, we, we created, you know, so when I ran across, I, I graduated from Boston College in 1984, and two weeks later, um, embarked on in my run across America, which was from Boston to Los Angeles, it was 3,300 miles. Um, we, you know, I, when I said I was going to run across America, I didn't know how I was going to do it. I just knew I was going to do it. So I put together a program. I incorporated nutrition back then. Um, I trained really, really hard my senior year in college. And I surrounded myself with a good team. I mean, you know, I had the, the benefit during the run of meeting Ronald Reagan, and I'll never forget um, reading follow-up stories about him. And, you know, many people say the reason for he was so successful as a president is he surrounded himself by really good people. And um, I was lucky because I was surrounded by a good family, but when I picked my road crew for my run to get me across the country, I realized no one person does any, anything. Mm -hmm. An organization is always built around people and team teamwork and teamwork was instilled in me playing sports growing up and in high school and college so when I started on my career on this uh, work in the financial service industry I also said I got to keep giving back and that's when when I finished my run in Los Angeles and my crew threw me into the Pacific Ocean <laughs> um, and I uh, I was um, lucky enough U University of Southern California started a scholarship fund for physically challenged athletes in the, uh, the two years prior to that. And it's called Swim With Mike. And I uh, was running in the Mojave Desert. I was two weeks from finishing my run. Just hearing you say this is just unbelievable. Um, and uh, the, the head of the, uh, the assistant athletic director at USC, Ron Orr, read an article in the paper that said I was, this amputee was going to be finishing in Los Angeles. And he got a hold of my road crew and said, what is Jeff planning on doing after the run? And they said, well, he's talked about law school. So um, Ron drove out to the Mojave Desert, um, and it was a surprise, and I was two weeks from finishing, and he said, well, when you're, done, when you're done with your run, we want to offer you a full scholarship to grad school um, underneath the Swim Mike umbrella. And so obviously I said yes, and I said, um, let me start a year from now. And Swim with Mike was really started by a Mike Nyhold, who was an all-American swimmer, and he was paralyzed from the waist down. And they had a swimathon every year after that to raise money for his van, but then in subsequent years uh, for uh, scholarships for physically disabled athletes. So when I got to USC and saw how they raised money through a swimathon at the Olympic pool there, and all the athletes, you know, the physically disabled athletes um, that they put through school. It was then that we started thinking about, well, why don't we, I've, I've run enough. I'm not going to run a, back across this Let's country. Let's swim. Why not? And so my, my roommate um, from BC, who was on my road crew, Matt Vossler, my childhood friend, came up with the concept. He said, why don't we take the Swim with Mike model and bring it back east and start Swim Across the Sound? And that was in 1987. Um, while I was in grad school, and, and that was the start of uh, several organizations that Matt and I would launch uh, to sort of bring awareness to cancer research, cancer survivorship, and at the same time, let's face it, have fun. And you've raised tens of millions of dollars along the way, and you have a facility in Fairfield. Are you done yet? Are you just going to keep... You, now, you've been at this full-time three years. You came out of the financial business. You've been at this three years. 
you're helping a ton of people with your stories. You're helping kids. What's next? Because is this it? I mean, this is plenty, and you've got the you have the bike race every every summer, and that's in July. Yep. And so now it's two days, correct? It's a two-day ride. So in uh, in 2005. Uh, we did launch from across, some, uh, excuse me, the Connecticut Challenge um, after spending 12 to 14 years building up from across America, which is now raising, you know, close to five or six million dollars a year and has raised over 50 million dollars. And it's got its own organization and, and Matt um, spearheads that with a, a bunch of other friends. But the challenge was started really, I wanted to start a survivor clinic in Connecticut and survivor programs. and. It wasn't that I wanted to do a bike ride. Um, it was how do we raise the money to do that? And obviously, we looked at models across the country, and biking was very popular. Um, you know, Billy Starr at the Pan Mass Challenge had done a phenomenal job raising money in a two-day event. And I said, why not try to do the same in Connecticut? Um, he really is a, uh, you know, he's a, he's a tremendous success. They raised thirty-two million dollars in a two-day event. Um, so I said, let's try to do this in Connecticut and fund survivorship programs across the state. So every summer, uh, and this summer, July 26th, July 27th, we have a charity bike ride. It's not a race. Um, there is uh, a, a, a route for everybody. We have a 10, mm -hmm. 25, 50, 75, 100, and now a, a, a two-day ride where you can ride a total of 185 miles. We have... Oh, gee, bring it on. Yes. 185 and miles. And everybody's required to... Uh, <laughs> to raise money. Um, it's a charity bike ride. We have ages from age 7 to 75. Last year we had over 85 cancer survivors that rode, of which five wow. of them were in active treatment. Um, my 7-year-old son did the 25-miler. Um, we had a 73-year-old who, who, who rode 75 miles. It's uh, now the largest charity bike event in the state um, and charity athletic event. And our goal is to make it one of the largest in New England. Um, this summer is going to be very, very special um, with this two-day ride. Uh, we have lots of folks from New York City coming out. And again, the idea behind all of this is to get everybody involved, because if you help somebody, you, you never know when you're going to need help yourself. So when you look at all of that you've created, this 12-year-old kid that gets cancer, you're 50 now. Let's just let's be honest. You've done all of this. Do you look back and say, "Yeah, this is good. This is this is what I wanted to do," or or is there more? Because it's the 12-year-old kid that has been driving all of this from the moment that you were told you had cancer and trying to deal with all the things that a 12-year-old deals with anyway. Lost your leg. Look what you've done. Do you ever stop and think about that? No, I, I look forward. I don't look backwards. I think what drives us every day, and you know, look, it's as you've heard me say, I don't take credit for start for for making these organizations successful. I only take credit for lighting the candle. And um, again, you know, it's there's thousands of volunteers that are behind the scenes, and really, really successful people who have stepped in. Um, I'm just one small part of all of this, and. You know, I, I look back and, and, and every day when I get up, I just don't forget the kids that, that I took chemotherapy with that, that didn't make it, that didn't have a chance to grow up and go to the, the prom in high school and graduate from college like I did. And I just honestly feel guilty. Um, and as I get older, every day that I'm here, I feel more and more guilty. You know, today there are 13 million survivors. Uh, that, that number is growing to 20 million. And the, the beauty of, this, of the science in, in this country right now is that survival rates have gone from 25% when I was a kid to 75%. So more and more people are surviving and they're living longer. But uh, what we do is try to raise the money. You know, if you talk to survivors, they feel like they've been dropped off a cliff when they're done with treatment um, and there's no post-cancer care. So that's where organizations like ourselves step in to try to, to fit that void and um, we do it through the bike ride. So I'm not sure if I answered your question about the you 12 did. year old. Well, but, um, just, just in closing, you know, you, you, you started a movement and that's terrific. And if you were the candle, the light, 
that's saying a lot in, in one's life. So thanks for doing that. And people can get involved, ctchallenge.org. Give you a call, get, get on a bike, Perfect. do whatever you have to do and help others. Jeff Keith, thanks very much for being on. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.